Ramsey TV. Welcome everybody to the edge of the bottom of the Florida Peninsula. I am Martin Sender, the world's most outspoken Bible scholar at your service. Once again, holding court from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I'm going to end the week on a different note than what we've been doing uh, for the last few days. I'm sure many of you are glad of that. I'm kind of glad of it myself. I am. It's no fun for me, but of course, as you know, it's necessary information. But today, I'm going to look at the beginning of the body of Christ in Acts chapter 13. And you are going to see, because I'm going to show you and I'm going to make sure you see, an amazing correspondence between something that happens in Acts 13 and a truth that Paul declares in Romans 11. So, several significant things happen in Acts chapter 13. So let's, let's take a look at that. Let's start with verse 1. Now there were in Antioch, to accord with the ecclesia which is there, prophets and teachers, both Barnabas and Simeon, called Niger, and Lucius the Cyrenian, besides Manon, the tetrarch Herod's foster brother, and Saul. Now, this is the first big thing. Are you ready for this? At their ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Now, I don't think there was a voice from heaven. I think the Holy Spirit spoke through one of these dudes. Maybe it was Simeon. Could have been Simeon. Could have been uh, Lucius the Cyrenian. That would have been my choice. The Holy Spirit speaks through Lucius the Cyrenian. We don't know. But the Holy Spirit said this, quote, Sever by all means to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Here it is. Now see, before this, Paul would be going into the synagogues and trying to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. He'd be using the Hebrew scriptures, the prophecies concerning Christ, coming to Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey and uh, being crucified between two thieves and they divide my clothing. All these prophecies, Paul would put it together for his brethren according to flesh, those who did not yet believe. And I'm convinced he brought some of them to understand Christ as their Messiah. But I think all the time he's doing that, between Acts 9 and Acts 13, I'm not sure how many years transpired there, not many at all, I don't think. Uh, during that time, he's also dropping little hints about his gospel, but not until Acts 13 do we really see it starting in earnest. This is the beginning of the body of Christ, not Acts 28, 28. This is it, the beginning of the body of Christ. So the Holy Spirit says, Sever to me, by all means, Barnabas and Saul, to the work which I have called them. Then... Fasting and praying and placing their hands on them, they dismiss them. I'm in verse 4 now of Acts chapter 13. They indeed then, being sent out by Holy Spirit, came down into Seleucia. That's what I would do. The first thing I would do, if I'm severed for the work which I was appointed to do, I would go down to Seleucia. I mean, what else? Besides, from thence, they sail away to Cyprus. And coming to be in Salamis, they announced the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. Now they had John also as deputy. I believe this was John Mark, Barnabas' nephew. It was Paul's habit. In these days, he went to the synagogues first. And he's not only trying to convince his brethren according to the flesh that Jesus is the Messiah, but he's also gathering the interest of some of the nations. Of course, there was always clashes. Whenever you get the Israel types together with the non-Israel types, you got trouble. Now, passing through the whole island up to Paphos, they found a certain man, a magician, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul. This is the proconsul of Paphos, namely Sergius Paul. He was a man of the nations. And it says in Acts 13.7, he was an intelligent man. 
he, calling to him, Barnabas and Saul, seeks to hear the word of God. This guy, turns out, we're going to see, has an antenna for Paul's gospel, though Paul's gospel has been rarely announced until this point, and it's possible that the full orb of the gospel is just now going to be announced. But that damn magician, Elymas, the magician, for thus his name is construed, you know, you could call him Bar Jesus if you want, or you can call him Elymas. Either way, he's a diabolical individual. A pain in the ass. This is what he did. He withstood them. He withstood Barnabas and Saul. Seeking to pervert the proconsul from the faith. This is so significant. I'm going to show you how significant in Romans 11. So here's Paul ready to announce the gospel to a man of the nations. And an Israel type, Bar Jesus, whose name is construed to be Elymas, withstands, seeking to keep the proconsul from the faith, doing everything he can to distract the proconsul. Sergius Paulus from hearing Paul. Now look at what happens in verse 9. Now Saul, who is also Paul, here it is. This is when his name is changed officially in the record. Saul who is also Paul. Saul is a Jewish name. It harkens back to the first king of Israel. Paul is a Greek name. See, Paul had, he was raised in Tarsus at the confluence of really the Jewish and the Greek worlds. So he had influences from both places, which served him well. And again, no one knew the circumcision evangel better than Saul. No one. He was trained in it. He was zealous. I mean, he was insane about it as we know. So, the name Saul relates him to that part of his career. Of his career. Paul, on the other hand, is a Greek name. It means pause. That's significant also in the Greek, pause. Because Paul now is introducing a pause, a long pause, turns out so far it's been 2,000 years, a pause of God's dealings with Israel. Okay? Israel has already been set aside at the rending of the temple veil, Matthew 27, 51. But now we see active opposition. And this has continued to this day, active opposition of the Israel types to any message that heralds Christ, let alone Paul's message of justification by faith, justification of the entire human race, those who have been condemned by Adam, and a celestial destiny, and the transformation of our bodies from mortal to immortal at the casting of an eye at the last trump. So he withstood them. Now Saul, who is also Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit, I love this part, I love it, being filled with the Holy Spirit, looking intently at him, says, O oh, fool of all guile and all knavery, son of the adversary, enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Man, this, this, this is a rant. Son of the adversary. I mean, that's bad. Today, we would, I mean, it's worse than son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. It's worse than that. Full of guile, knavery, son of the adversary, enemy of all righteousness. Paul says this after being filled with the Holy Spirit. See, I take my cue from this. We think that, oh, there's no way that someone under the influence of the Holy Spirit will call someone son of the adversary and enemy of all righteousness. But the Holy Spirit heh, is tough love. God is tough love. So when the Holy Spirit inspires someone, the love is tough. I've lived by this, and you should too. And you should too. It's tough love. You have to sometimes crack the nut. Well, the nut here is Elymas, and Paul's cracking him, all right. And now, lo, the hand of the Lord is on you, and you shall be blind. Follow this now. You shall be blind, not observing the sun until the appointed time. Okay, bookmark that. Keep that right here. 
because I'm going to go to Romans and show you the macrocosmic version of this tiny little seemingly insignificant event in Paphos, but it's not insignificant. So what do you think happened? Well, instantly there falls on him a fog and darkness. And going about, he sought someone to lead him by the hand. I almost feel bad for this guy. I mean, I almost want to cry. I mean, the guy's a son of the adversary and an enemy of all righteousness. But he's, redu he's humbled. He's reduced to finding someone to lead him by the hand. It's pathetic. It's really sad. But as we shall see, there's a restoration for this man. There is a rest restitution and there is a good ending for Bar Jesus. Isn't that strange that Jesus is in his name? Then the proconsul, perceiving what has occurred, believes, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Also, I have to think, not only it was he astonished at the teaching of the Lord? The context doesn't tell us what Paul said to him. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall or a grasshopper on the floor or a bird in the rafters, a cockroach in the seams of the state building where Sergius Paulus held court. Oh, I would have loved it. So he's astonished not only by the teaching, but I think he's astonished by the miracle. Paul just blinded a guy. Paul just spoke the word and the guy was blind. Impressive. And this guy operated Alamus under the pretense of helping the proconsul. Don't worry, proconsul. I'm going to keep this guy from messing with your head. This guy won't mess with your head on my watch, proconsul. Well, Paul wouldn't have it. And the proconsul, <laughs> instead of feeling bad for his little servant there, Ignores him completely. Ah, go find somebody to lead you by the hand. Now, Paul, tell me more about this gospel of yours. Now, I could go on here in Acts 13, and I think I will. Paul mentions justification for the first time in Acts 13, 28. Let it be known to you, men, brethren, that through this one, capital O, is being announced to you the pardon of sins, that was for Israel, and catch this, from all from which you could not be justified in the law of Moses. And we know Paul says in Romans 6, that by works of law, no flesh at all shall be justified. So, of course, they couldn't be justified by the law of Moses. Paul was reiterating this. So, I'm announcing to you the pardon of sins and from all which you could not be justified in the law of Moses. In this one, everyone who is believing is being justified. This is it. The first announcement that we have recorded in Scripture of justification. Justification by faith. Anyone who believes is being justified. Remember, pardon takes guilt for granted. You can't even speak of pardoning someone. That is letting someone off the penalty if they're pronounced righteous. So, pardon assumes guilt. Justification denies guilt. Pardon assumes guilt. Justification denies guilt. So what do we have here so far? We have the Holy Spirit personally severing Barnabas and Saul for the work which they were called to do by God. Then you have them traveling to Cyprus and to Paphos. They encounter a man of the nations who becomes the first convert to the body of Christ. The first, let me let me correct that. The first man of the nations, because Barnabas and Saul were Jews. I'm assuming that Barnabas and his nephew, John Mark, I'm assuming that they heard Paul. Paul slipped them his evangel on the side. Hey, by the way, guys, you want to hear something cool? How would you like to be justified from all that you could not be justified in the law of Moses? And they said, where do we sign up? But they were Jews. This man was of the nations. Not one drop of Israelite blood. And he becomes the first man of the nations to be, to be a member of the body of Christ. What, a, what an audacious, wonderful, esteemed event for this guy. That's definitely top of his, of his resume. 
All right, now I'm going to go to Romans 11 because what just happened here? Look what happened. Oh, and then justification comes up. So we got, yeah, oh, and Paul's name's changed. I, I, I can't keep track of it all. The Holy Spirit severs Saul. Saul blinds an Israelite, blinds an Israelite in order to enlighten a man of the nations. And then he teaches on justification. You tell me this isn't where the body of Christ starts? It is. Romans 11, verse 7. What then? What Israel is seeking for, this she did not encounter, yet the chosen encountered it. Now the rest were calloused, even as it is written. God gives them a spirit of stupor, eyes not to be observing, and ears not to be hearing till this very day. Eyes not to be observing. What did Paul do to bar Jesus? blinded him eyes not to be seen and that was the occasion of blessings coming to Sergius Paulus the man of the nations a Jew is blinded and that became the occasion for the gospel to go to a man of the nations now listen to Paul in verse 11 I'm saying then, do they not trip that they should be falling speaking of Israel may it not be coming to that but in their offense is salvation to the nations to provoke them to jealousy. Let me continue reading. I think you know where I'm going already. Now, if their offense is the world's riches and their discomfiture, the nation's riches, how much rather that which fills them? For if they're casting away, Israel's casting away is the conciliation of the world, what will the taking back be, if not life from among the dead? Do you see it? In Acts 13, Paul blinds one Jewish guy who was trying to withstand him. And the proconsul was so shocked, so amazed by this, now that the Israel guy, the pain in the ass, the son of the adversary, enemy of all righteousness, now that he's out of the way, and his distractions and his nasty words about Paul. He didn't even know Paul. That was kind of rude. But now that he's out of the way, blessings come to this man of the nations. Now you see, this is happening in Romans 11 on a large scale. The same thing. Israel's blinded as a nation in order for the other nations, the non-Israelite nations, to come to the truth. That's the big picture, but it's the same thing happening. Jews are blinded, and it becomes the occasion for the nations to come in. It's perfect. It's perfect. There were only three people involved in the first event, the microcosmic event in Acts 13. Saul, who then became Paul, Bar-Jesus, and Sergius Paulus. Classic, the Jew withstands. The man of the nations, the Jew is dismissed, blinded for a season. Remember what Paul said to him? You're going to be blinded for a se till the till the appointed time. You are blinded. Paul, quoting him, Acts 13, you are blinded. You will not see the light of day until the appointed time. Likewise, in the big picture, Israel as a nation has been blinded and they will not see the light of day until the appointed time. And that appointed time will not arrive until the fullness of the nations come in. And the first fruit of that crop was Sergius Paulus, the proconsul of Paphos. Wow, incredible. What a plan. What an organization God has. He gives little tiny pictures, just like the lamb that pictured Christ. And then he fulfills it in a big way, right? And uh, Matthew 24, the same thing. He's telling Israel uh, that there's going to be trouble coming up. He's speaking of the sacking of Jerusalem by the armies of Titus of, of Rome. They're to flee to the hills. Well, that was a small picture of the tribulation when the entire nation from near and far, those chosen, for instance, 144,000, the vast throng, they will be going into the wilderness. Well, maybe the, not the 144,000 because they're miraculously sealed. But Israel's going to have to go to the hills again. And this time, it's a greater threat. This time, the world, the earth is teeter-tottering. 
on the brink of destruction because of the trials of the tribulation. First fruit, ingathering. Microcosm, macrocosm. A type and the fulfillment of the type. And Paul says, what will their taking back be? He's telling the nations, be appreciative. You really owe the Israelite types for rejecting God and getting in the way and being blind and being deaf and dumb because, because of their discomfiture, Paul says in Romans 11, salvation has come to the nations. You're being blessed at their disadvantage, at their cursing, at their being cast away by God temporarily. But they will be taken back. Paul says, what will their taking back be, if not life from among the dead? And Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant of the secret, brethren, Romans 11, 25, that callousness on Israel in part has come until the fullness of the nations may be entering. LMS is going to be in the corner rubbing his eyes, wah, 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 until Sergius Paulus comes into the fullness of the belief. Likewise, Israel as a nation, wah, wah, off to the corner, you can't see anything until the fullness of the nations come in, of which Sergius Paulus was the first fruit, and thus all Israel shall be saved according as it is written. And if that's true in the big picture, then someday that nasty little ratty magician will be saved. See, I'm going backwards now. I'm taking what Paul says at the end of Romans 11, and thus all Israel shall be saved according as it is written. Acts 11, I'm sorry, Romans 11, 26. Love that. I love that. So now let's go back. Because the type of that was poor little, ratty little, whiny magician. He's going to be saved. We're going to be there to see it. You see this beautiful plan God has? You see he gives us little pictures so we can understand, and then he extrapolates and says, look at this. This is, this is the fulfillment of it. This is how it works. We're serving a mastermind. We're serving someone who moves human beings where he wants them to give us truth, to show us pictures, to help us understand. And these things are graspable. They're meant to be understood. They're meant to be grasped. And God helps us again with the first fruit and then with the fullness. If we're paying attention and we, you and I, are paying attention.